Hello and welcome. You're watching another episode of Magna Indica with me, Devika Chopra. I have Rishabh back with us in the studio. Rishabh, it's just been Diwali week and we have another very interesting segment that you've come up with for this episode. Um, as we know Diwali, I mean, we've all celebrated it as children in our homes. We've grown up, we've heard the stories and we've also seen in a way how Diwali has spread and become a global festival in recent times. What a lot of people don't perhaps um, know about or understand is the extent to which the whole idea of a Lord Ram actually existed in the world. So because it's been Diwali week, um, let's take our viewers through what is it that you found you know, uh, Devika, you know, the, the genesis of this conversation is that, you know, I was going through some, you know, friends uh, who live in other parts of the world and uh, they're celebrating the valley. Now, you understand the concept because they are Indians who, you know, maybe the second generation, third generation Indians who are living in the UK. Rishi Sunak is celebrating the valley because, of course, he's a second generation Indian. Hmm. So you understand people of an ethnic Indian origin celebrating the valley. Okay. And the Diwali is coming in a context. Uh, this is a time when a couple of months from now, we will be uh, re inaugurating the grand uh, temple of Ram in Ayodhya. Now, the thing is, there is a lot of conversation about Hinduism, about Ram Rajya. The reality is we sitting here in India, forget in other parts of the world, we ourselves don't understand what this Hinduism, Ram Rajya, Indic civilization really is. Hmm. Because your definition of an Indian diaspora and to you know, put it into an, a, a religious ethnicity, a Hindu diaspora would be the Rishi Sunaks, who are the second generation uh, Hindus who are celebrating Diwali. Now we've done these conversations on television that yes. the Ramayana is performed in Cambodia, in Laos, in in Bali, in Vietnam, hmm. uh, in Indonesia, in Hong Kong. So what is this Indic civilization? So I had some friends of mine who were not Indians, ethnic Thais. Hmm. They're not second, third generation Indian that there were some Gujaratis or Tamils uh, or Punjabis who are living in Thailand and they happen to be celebrating Diwali. No, ethnic Thais doing puja to Lord Ganesh. Yes. And then, you know, forget the history books and the and the archaeology and all the other things that you can you can draw the linkages with. This is living and breathing that you can see that these are people of a completely different ethnicity who have such same cultural roots that in common parlance, in daily parlance, it would be recognizable to you and me. Mm. And I thought that is worth con conversing in this episode of Magna Indica. So, Rishabh, like you said, we've we've spoken about this earlier a bit on our channel. And those uh, recordings are there, of course, on YouTube for people to actually go back and watch. Uh, this was around the time when the Ram Mandir was, in fact, announced. When mm. we, you know, went into the like I said, the extent of the impression of Lord Ram across the world uh, and how so many cultures beyond just what we call the Indian subcontinent today or India today, hmm. how his idea was actually not just restricted to here. Lord Ram was not restricted to India, but to several other cultures and several other nations. So let's begin with Thailand, for example. It's a good example since I just mentioned it. I mean, like I said, I don't want to go into the, too deep into the history and the archaeology of it. Okay, let's look at things as they exist. Uh, Lord Ram, Ram Rajya, such controversial topics in India and even in the West. It's not a controversial topic in Thailand. Hmm. Now, Thailand is 95% Buddhist. It's not a Hindu majority country. The There are less than 80,000 practicing Hindus. Most of them are the second, third generation Indians or first generation Indians who have gone there for economic migration. Hmm. But when it comes to Thailand, I mean, just think about the basics. The ruling monarch of Thailand is currently King Rama X. Hmm. The Thai state emblem, the emblem of the state, you know, we have the, the, the three lines yes. of Sarnath. The emblem of the Thai state is what? Is the Garuda. Now we know uh, the uh, Garuda is, is the bird on which uh, Vishnu used to ride, okay? That's their state emblem. So their head of state is King Rama. Their state emblem is the Garuda. Okay. When you land in Bangkok, you land in the Swarna Bhumi. Swarna is gold. Bhumi is land. Swarna Bhumi International Airport, the golden airport, it's Sanskrit. Now, this is because Thai history is sharing its root in Indic history. Where does it come from? For the better part of five centuries, 
the main power in Thailand was the kingdom of Ayutthaya. Hmm. Okay. Now we are talking about modern day Ayutthaya. Okay. That's the kingdom of Ayutthaya. So the kingdom of Ayutthaya is the dominant political force in central Thailand. When it was finally defeated by Burmese invasion in 1767 and a new uh, Thai state was created in Bangkok just a few years later in 1780s, uh, King Rama the first, which is the which is the the uh, royal lineage uh, that exists today. Hmm. The first thing the king did was create a devasthan in Bangkok. It still exists today. One of the you know preeminent rites they used to have, which is the uh, swinging ceremony, for which they uh, which they've stopped doing it now, but uh, they created a swing which is Vedic and Brahmanical tradition. In fact, uh, uh, Tamil scripture is still quoted when they have the coronation ceremony of the Thai kings. So there is so much relatable when it comes to Thailand, which does not require history. It requires just traveling there and you'll be looking around and going, hmm, Swarna Bhumi, I understand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go to Bangkok, you know, and uh, there's a there's a river that runs through the center of, ba- center of Bangkok. It's called the, Cha- uh, the, the Chao Paraya. Forgive my pronunciation of it. Okay. Now, the kingdom of Ayutthaya, which was a riverine kingdom based around this, uh, this river, what were the principal cities? The principal city was Ayutthaya, okay, which is recognizable. The other city was Sompuri, okay, Lopuri, Sufanpuri. Now, if you come from Vikaspuri in Delhi, you will totally relate, okay, because the principal three cities, and this was a kingdom when you had your travelers uh, going through this region, they said this is one of the three most powerful kingdoms in Asia, hmm. kingdom of Ayutthaya, okay. It is at the same uh, same rank as Vijayanagar is the same rank as the Chinese Empire. These are the guys who are running this part of the world. Okay, they call themselves the Kingdom of Ayutthaya. Uh, they are worshiping whom? They are worshiping Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Parvati, Ganesh. Hmm. Okay, in fact, Shivlings have been found uh, in central and uh, central Thailand. They that go back at least thousand, two thousand years. Uh, Shiv paintings have been found going back to the twelfth century A.D. Uh, this is the part of, of of central Thailand. So this is uh, the very understandable culture. So if you're from South India, you would understand that uh, you are either Shivite or Vaishnavite. It was the same. Hmm. So there were uh, Shiv paintings, Shiv temples. There were Vishnu statues, which go back even, they go back to the 4th century AD. Hmm. Okay. And all the way till the 12th century AD. So for 800 years, there was a Vaishnavite culture along with the Shivite culture. So something that was very familiar to people who are living in this country, okay, were equally familiar to the people of Thailand, are still familiar, is not controversial to them. You know, I mentioned the coronation ceremony of the Thai king. When they do the coronation ceremony, uh, it is supervised by Brahmins. In fact, there are two royal, uh, well, two lineages of Brahmins. One is called the uh, Brahma Luang, okay, the Brahm Luang, Brahmin Luang, and the Brahm Chao. Okay, hmm. the royal Brahmins and the people's Brahmins, they still exist and they still are the heads of the investiture ceremony that happens during the cor- 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 coronation. And what is the coronation? The coronation is coming from Thirupavai and Thiruvempavai. Now, Thirupavai and Thiruvempavai are Tamil literations of Vedic rites hmm. and they are still quoted in the coronation ceremony that is taking place in Thailand. So, you know, when we are talking about Indic civilization, then there are modern day people from Tamil Nadu, from Bengal, from Punjab, you know, who are living in Thailand, okay? What we don't understand is if you were to go to Thailand, Hmm. everything would, in its nomenclature, its language, its semantics would seem oddly familiar. And there is a fundamental reason it's oddly familiar. And here is a Buddhist country I mean, almost 100% Buddhist, okay? That has King Rama, okay? Mm. And then we have a controversy in India about King Ram. We have a controversy in the West about King Ram. Oh, Ram Raja is something very, 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 very dubious. It is some sort of, uh, uh, you know, there is a, a Hindu unilateralism. Hindu Tva is happening over here. You tell that to a Thai person and they laugh at you that uh, King Ram is a problem because they're a, they a Buddhist civilization. So Thailand is just one such example, which is so relatable, Devika. And as far as relatability is concerned, Rishabh, also, of course, one has to discuss Cambodia because mm. that's actually a very popular tourist destination anyway because of the fact that it's the home to some of the oldest Hindu temples 
in the world. And there's so much work that India, in fact, has done with Cambodia to ensure the restoration. There have been excavations where shivlings, centuries-old shivlings have been uh, unearthed. So if you can, you know, tell us you a know, little bit Like about... I said, you know, it's so relatable, okay, just in the language of it, okay? Now, uh, when we talk about Cambodia, Cambodia was a, sh- a Shaivite Hindu place till the 4th century, 14th century AD. Hmm. Okay. So going back to historical tradition, till about four, 500 years ago, it was majority Shaivite Hindus. In fact, you know, the founder of the Khmer dynasty, which is the ruling dynasty of, of, of Cambodia, what was his name? His name was Jaya Varman hmm. the second. Does it sound familiar? There's a reason it sounds familiar. Okay. Uh, he gave himself the titles. Number one was Devaraja and number two was Chakravartin. Okay. So, the the founder of the Khmer dynasty is the name. His name is Jayavarman. He has called himself Devaraja, and he's given himself the title Chakravartin. Okay, mm. these are all familiar to anybody who's seen Mahabharata on TV, okay, or Ramayana on TV. They, they're so familiar. Uh, in the Khmer dynasty, Sanskrit was the official court language. They used to speak Sanskrit. All their official court records were written in in Sanskrit. In fact, you can find Sanskrit inscriptions in Hindu temples all over Cambodia dating back to this time. Okay. So the language is familiar, the names are familiar. Uh, most likely they were linked to the Cholas. Now you mentioned the ancient temples and when we think of Cambodia, the first name that comes to mind as tourist destination is what? Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat okay. Yes. Now Angkor Wat, which was built by Surya Varman, who was a descendant of the Khmer dynasty. And when he built this in the in the 12th century, it was a Vishnu temple. Hmm. So Surya Varman, okay, built a Vishnu temple called Angkor Wat, okay? And the reason it was called Angkor, because Angkor, okay, came from the word Nagara in Sanskrit, okay, Nagar, hmm. and Wat means temple. So the city of temples, it had a Sanskrit root, even the name had a Sanskrit root, okay? And when he built the temple in the 12th century, what was it called? It was called Param Vishnu Lok. Param Vishnu Lok, the grandest home of Vishnu. And that's how you know it was built uh, as a Vishnu temple. Now, what happens is, uh, he had a chief advisor. What was his chief advisor's name? His chief advisor's name was Devakar Pandit. Now, Devakar Pandit is somebody you and I could bump down the street uh, and find Devakar as a common name and Pandit as a common name. So, you don't have to have read your history. You could be walking on the streets and these names will be seem oddly familiar. And they are eight, nine hundred thousand years ago talking about Cambodian history that an advisor to the king, okay, hmm. uh, Surya Varman, by the name of Divakar Pandit, suggested that they build a grand temple to Vishnu. So they were Vaishnavites, okay. They built a temple to Vishnu. Once they built the temple to Vishnu, then of course Buddhist uh, conversion happened. And when the Buddhist conversion happened, and this happened in 1180, okay, so you have a descendant. This guy is called Surya Varman the fourth. Okay, he's got himself a, a a wife. Okay, guess what the wife's name was? Indra Devi. So he marries a woman called Indra Devi. Hmm. She converts to Buddhism. Okay. And around the year 1180, uh, they convert Angkor Wat, and it converts from a Vishnu site, uh, a Vishnu temple, to a Buddhist site at it, as it is found today. In fact, just about 25 kilometers. And this, uh, you know, this is absolutely fascinating. Devika, there's a place in Karnataka, okay? It is called the Saharsalinga, okay? Now, the Saharsalinga is on the uh, Shalmala River, okay? Uh, which is a small rivulet. And on the banks of the river where the rocks are, they've carved, people have counted about a thousand shivlings. The mm. exact same replica can be found in a valley called Kabal Span. Forgive me for my pronunciations, okay? This is in north-central Cambodia, okay? Uh, just a few kilometers from Angkor Wat. Same river in area. Mm. Okay, carved shivlings on the on the river bank, paintings of Shiva, paintings of the Nandi bull. Mm. Okay, all things that would be so familiar to anybody traveling from India, you could instantly relate it because it's so ingrained in your civilization. And then we say Hindu, 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 because we don't understand it. There are only in Cambodia officially only thousand Hindus. Wow, and they've okay. still managed to retain it's only a thousand because those thousand hindus are the people who went recently okay who are still hindus okay Mm. but their entire historical cultural tradition 
including the performance of the Ramayana that happens over there, is Indic. Okay, is because we confuse Hindu Hindu tradition, Vedas. This is all Hindu. It's religion. It's India. Okay, uh, is that we get confused that there is an Indic civilization in Hinduism basically refers to the peoples following mm. the pagan religion by a name given as we've often discussed where the name Hinduism comes from, uh, from the river Indus uh, and its corruption. The conceptualization extends. We've gone into Thailand. Now mm. you go to Cambodia. You can keep on going into Southeast Asia and you'll see the same uh, facts repeating themselves. Devika. In fact, even Burma has a very uh, interesting history. The most significant, okay, Burma. All right. I want you to think of the name Burma. Does it sound familiar? Okay, not from Mountbatten or Burma. Mm. Okay. The most significant literation of the name Burma is from, probably from Brahmadesh. Brahma. Okay. Which when the British came and the people like Mountbatten came, the Brahma became Burma. Burma. Now, why does Brahma and Burma, what is the connotation? Okay. Now, we, let's put this in a modern context. Okay, what's happened recently? You have Myanmarese, Myanmar, they call it now. Okay, these troops have entered uh, into, into India's northeast. Okay, uh, where Manipur. Okay, hmm. Manipur at this point of time, a few hundred years ago, is one of the greatest kingdoms uh, in this part of the world. Okay, and uh, there was a direct route of, of migration from Manipur into, into what is modern day uh, Myanmar. Okay, if you go to Yangon, uh, you can find an extant Shri Kali temple present over there till the beginning of the of the 19th century. So till the First World War, okay, till the First World War, 55% of the population in the capital city Yangon was Hindu. Okay, okay. so you don't have to go into uh, thousand years ago, fifteen hundred years ago. It was thousand, fifteen hundred, two hundred, two thousand years that a Indic cultural tradition was extending, which was extant till the beginning of the 19th century. You had people from Tamil Nadu, people from Bengal, okay? Obviously, people from Manipur had come there. Hmm. The Burmese language has its root in Sanskrit and Pali. So, a lot of the of the word nomenclature comes from Sanskrit, okay? There's a, there's a you know, state which you've done discussions on, Arakan, the Arakan state, okay? Hmm. What was the historic capital of Arakan called? The historic capital of Arakan, ladies and gentlemen, is such a familiar name, Ramavati. Okay, was the mm -hmm. one of the major cities of Arakan province. You know, we've discussed is one of the Khan states uh, in, in, in Burma right now. The second state was Dhanyavati, the second name of the second city. Okay, then in southeast, uh, southwest Burma, uh, southeast Burma, there was a, 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 a city called Dwarvavati. Hmm. Dwar, Dor, okay, Dwarka, Dwarvati. So you have Dhanyavati, Ramavati, Dwarvati, okay. And the argument goes that these were principal cities that belong to a kingdom which uh, in nomenclature can be referred to as Ramannadesh. Hmm. Okay? The kingdom of Ram. Hmm. Okay? That they followed the Manusmriti in Burma. Okay? Uh, we're talking about Middle Ages. So, the temple cities. Okay? Uh, you know, forget uh, uh, the, the ones I've already mentioned which had the names. The cities that were formed for temples. Okay? There is a major city called the which have, which hosts the Nathlong Kuang Temple. The Nathlong Kuang Temple dates back a thousand years, so probably mm. 10th or 11th century AD. Okay, what is the temple to? The temple is to Vishnu. Okay, so another Vaishnavite tradition over here. The most famous Buddhist building is this golden stupa. Mm. Okay, uh, it's called the pagoda. Okay. And this is one of the most, in fact, the, the Golden Pagoda is supposed to uh, bear, you know, their artifacts, including eight strands of hair of the Buddha are supposed to be housed in this, in this pagoda. It's most likely that this pagoda, which exists in Shwedagon, okay, that this was built on the site of a Vishnu temple dating back to before Christ. Okay, so maybe two thousand, two and a half thousand years ago. So, Sanskrit language, court language, look at the names of the cities, hmm. okay, look at the name of the state itself, okay, they are, uh, look, uh, you know, from every very natural aspect that if you were just to go through the basics, you would go, hmm, Ramannadesh, Brahma, Burma, Dhanyavati, this all sounds oddly familiar, hmm. okay. That's because it's not a coincidence. You're talking about a large Indic civilization. Uh, hardly any Hindus left in Burma right now. I mean, uh, 
you know uh, if you go back just a you know few decades they were still use, using you know uh, a lunar calendar which had which had which had derived from india hmm. so everything would be familiar to anybody from india traveling to these places and reading the basics about what what where these places were built, were built from devika and another very interesting place is uh, indonesia in fact i was in bali myself last year so this is something that like you said right you just have to go there to really understand see it uh, the fact that every single house has a ganesh murti outside you can go and see it there no be- because bali to this day is 85% hindu yes okay now these are not indians who are who went there you know like hmm. in mauritius and seychelles okay these are ethnic balinese hmm. who are hindu they worship ganesh to this day they perform the ramayana okay uh, and diwali is a big deal from them and when it comes you know so speak of indonesia i remember when i was you know in school all right and there was this first president who became very controversial towards the end of his tenure called sukarno hmm. and as a young boy i found it very strange because he had a daughter and his daughter's name was sukarno putri hmm. now that can't be a coincidence putri means daughter sukarno's daughter yeah. she was literally just called sukarno's daughter okay sukarno putri hmm. and i'm thinking you know this is odd but you know you think it's odd yeah it could be because you know you don't pay attention to these matters but there are you know recently a couple of years ago there's a big uh, conversation of you know has she converted uh, you know back to hinduism from islam or not okay the uh, whether that's true or untrue there are certain members of uh, the the ruling elite in indonesia okay even though it's a one of the largest muslim countries in the world yes. okay in fact the largest muslim country in the world hmm. the royal family of indonesia in 2019 they were here and what were they visiting the temple of jagannath puri hmm. okay i mean you can you can uh, read this yourself so they're roaming around india because they they still have roots so sukarno putri okay i mentioned the garuda okay as the symbol uh, as the emblem state official emblem of thailand the garuda is also in the official official emblem of indonesia yes okay now that uh, yet another coincidence obviously it can't be a coincidence no? so so okay let's get back to bali okay so the area around bali which is java okay you can you can find references to this and you can argue that in one of the places they were hunting for sida was you know ceylon but they were also java java is only a few hundred kilometers from the mm-hmm. andamans okay so in this conversation uh, in about the 10th or 11th century as the historical records go okay you have uh, a king by the name of udayan okay uh, and his name was udayan varma deva hmm. uday varma varma i mean you could be walking around south delhi and you would meet an uday you would meet a varma you would meet a dev hmm. okay that was the founder of the kingdom that you know that uh, in which bali was prospering okay he had a wife and uh, the wife's name was mahandretta okay mahan ratta okay the by the time the the balinese kingdoms uh, uh, and they are they are waxing and waning and by the time the end comes during the, about the 14th century uh um, majapahit is the last hindu kingdom of this peninsula of this of this island region along along java okay but in uh, java as i mentioned you have the uh, epics that are talked about the epics talk about them uh you can find shivalingas that go back to the 8th century so at least uh, 300 years before the hindu kingdoms so mm-hmm. that you know that they existed there are cities and regions okay so look at this they uh in one of the premier kingdoms which was called kutai okay they had a region by the name of kalinga yeah this kalinga sound familiar to you mm. okay they had a region this is the 4th century so you're talking about 1500 years ago they had a kalinga in java okay mm. they had a tarun nagar in java now tarun nagar does do these names sound familiar okay and uh, what do they call what do what do they call the ramayana they call it the ram kavaka the ram katha okay now it would be so oddly familiar yet we don't understand it that this is an indic civilization and we fail to recognize it fail to separate it now here you have a muslim majority country hmm. okay largest muslim country in the world which has indic civilizational roots it celebrates them happily they are not shy about their lord ganesha and lord rama and the ramayana we for some reason are very really apologetic about it it's very confusing especially we study the history in devika fact, in uh, in bali rishab when you go uh, there are so many statues of so many you know characters from the mahabharat as well uh, 
um, and my mom was also in Bali, and she in fact shared this with me. She, there, there would, uh, there was a statue of two brothers, and she couldn't quite figure it out. So she asked the taxi driver, and he said, "Oh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the the Pandavas, uh, Nakul uh, and Sadev." <laughs> You and know. my mom said, okay, you know, we for us, the Mahabharat usually ends at well, Arjun. Uh, and here, there are I people... I mean, certainly who, won't be making statues of Nakul and say they have not, many people would have it in their houses here, exactly. but you will find them in the houses of Bali. So like I said, we are so, dis, we have just become so disconnected with just what is living. This is not, this is right now. This is not necessarily history. It is living and breathing. Yes. So relatable in the names, in the nomenclature, in the places. Uh, that would be so recognizable to anyone. It doesn't stop there. You can keep on going all the way down to Malaysia and it would all be the same, Devika. Absolutely. And of course, one other uh, country, Rishabh, that becomes very interesting. And again, it's a very popular destination, tourist destination for Indians, but I'm not sure how much of our own history and how much of our own culture we actually end up finding there and identifying there. And I'm talking about Vietnam. Okay. So when we think of Vietnam, the first thing and only thing that probably comes to mind currently is probably a holiday. Hmm. Before that is probably the Vietnam War. Yes. Okay. Uh, what doesn't come to mind is that the ruling kingdom of Vietnam from the 2nd century AD all the way up till the 19th century, which is 18 something, mm. was the kingdom called the Champa dynasty. Mm. Does Champa sound familiar to you? Okay. Maybe it should. Uh, it comes uh, from the vernacular, which is very much Indian. Okay. They have found uh, 7th century Shivalinga. So these are Shaivites. Okay. Uh, very recently, uh, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar, I think this was about a year or so ago, uh, in a in a in a region called Maison, this is in the Kuang Nam province, they discovered this 11th century massive shivling. Okay, and he said, okay, and you know, and Jay Shankar commented on this that it speaks about you know, uh, you know, long cultural traditions. Now, for the better part of 1800 years, the ruling dynasty is the Champa dynasty. Their court language and they, the royals themselves, speak Sanskrit. Okay. What are their capitals called? Their capitals are called Simhapur. Their capitals are called Virapur. Their capital is called Indrapur. And their capital is called Vijaya. So once again, repeat. These are the names of their capitals. Hmm. Simhapur, Virapur, Indrapur, Vijaya. Okay. Are these familiar names? Would an Indian find these familiar? You would find them. We, know, we all know Vijay means. Okay. It's, it's victory, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the name of the capital. And this is all the way going back from the 5th, 6th century all the way till the 14th, 15th century. Uh, these were the capitals. This is the capital city of the kingdom of Vietnam is called Vijay. It's called Indrapur, okay? In fact, Devika, the descendants, the ethnic Cham people, okay? The descendants qualify in modern day anthropology, okay? As one of the very few non- Indian ethnic Hindus. They are still practicing Hindus, hmm. but they have their own independent Hindu history dating back to two and a half thousand years. So they are non-Indian ethnic Hindus. Okay. So these are people who look nothing like you and me. Hmm. Okay. Who have a completely different ethnic history, geographical background, far away from what we traditionally call India. And they are Hindus. Okay. And uh, nobody is telling them to fear Ram Rajya and Hindutva rise and uh, this dies. Okay. So now there was a, a, they had a neighboring kingdom. Okay. The Champas called Funan. We're going back to the 4th century AD, wherever Hindu, Hinduism came from. Okay. And uh, these areas had temples. Mm -hmm. They had brick temples. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, Mysore, which is where the Shivalinga was discovered, okay, was a religious center during this time. Yes. It was one of the main port cities of this, uh, of the, the Champa kingdom. Okay. And today it's a world heritage site. Yes. Okay. So the Champa kingdom, which is a, uh, you know, uh, which is a, a kingdom, which is official language is Sanskrit, whose capital is Indrapura. Okay. Uh, whose uh, uh, leaders are, are Hindus uh, who have progenitated the only other ethnic Hindu civilization in the world. Today, these people, okay, are interlinked in an Indic civilization. And, you know, I can, we can discuss this as we go for, forward into Laos. You can have the same conversation in Malaysia, okay? So, Devika, the, you know, the sum total of, of really all of this uh, is, and, you know, we, we have to open our minds, hmm. okay? And there are two points I want to make here. 
which is where we began number 1 look in a fundamental sense when we talk about hinduism we as indian hindus have no idea okay when we talk about a hindu diaspora we are talking about rishi sunak hmm. okay literally whose wife is narayan murthy's uh, daughter okay we are talk about maybe one generation removed hmm. two generations removed three generations removed at at best you talking about mauritius and seychelles a uh, 100 years removed okay this is what we understand as indian diaspora okay oic okay what is it P- pio card okay and uh, 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 nri okay what we don't comprehend is the swad of indic civilization okay because most of these countries hmm. come from an indic root which they are very proud of heck that's there in their emblems many of these countries are now buddhist majority and we all know where buddhism originates from yes okay even in the countries where have very little practicing hindus left they are praying to ganesha they call their king rama they perform the ramayana they celebrate diwali okay all their semantics their language their names their rulers their kingdoms their capital cities are all familiar nomenclature for indians okay and yet we seem to think that the only indic diaspora is indians who went abroad a, yes. a, a couple of decades ago so our thought process has to change and if it changes then the what we understand in terms of hindu changes mm. what we understand when people say that ram rajya if you went and told the thai people that there is a concept called ram rajya they would say yes it absolutely okay we are a buddhist state but we totally get it but if you say ram rajya in india okay oh my god hmm. uh, it's a, it's a very controversial it's seen as far right so we have just lost context so badly and and you know we had this look east policy and i would recommend to a lot of people listening to this podcast just imagine something that are so familiar to anybody who's had an indian upbringing hmm. okay doesn't realize that the vietnamese the thai the cambodians the people from laos from from java from large parts of indonesia parts of malaysia uh, from brahma okay have all had similar civilizational roots yes and uh, that is something that is so wondrous and so eye opening and requires so much more conversation research writing and i'm hoping it happens and i'm hoping people watching this uh, take it forward absolutely and rishab one last thing how do you think is there something that we can then perhaps learn from these civilizations because like you said there's something has probably gone wrong with us here in uh, you know has it been our inability to sort of really understand our true values uh, and go deep into the history of our culture which is something that probably some of these nations have managed to do and therefore uh, the concept of a ram rajya is not threatening to these civilizations you know i've had this conversation on tv some some several times okay so when you look at the arthurian model okay arthur and the knights of the round table round table okay and this is a chivalric order it is rooted in christianity is rooted in you know in the knights templar uh, logic of what a knight is okay mm. uh, but when you talk about uh, king arthur okay you you are talking about chivalry and justice and fairness and they sit on a round table so you know there's is equality mm. amongst peers uh, you take the christian context is default uh, but you're looking at the good things coming from it similarly when you should talk about ram rajya you rather than taking the fairness and jurisprudence and uh, dhamma as as ashoka would say the concept of dhamma okay a, a fair world a just world instead of looking at that you look at it in a, in a religious context so we have these failings and these failings are primarily because we have just lost touch with who we are now you can blame the british okay you can blame the you know the lord lord macaulay and company who you know tried to say that you know when we'll we'll talk talk like english englishmen dress like englishmen you can see over here okay uh and they'll make you forget who you are hmm. i've always held the belief that as you see the troubles that are taking place in in jerusalem right now in gaza right now okay and the other ills that happen in the world uh the founding of the great countries of today uh the united states of america we know how the country was founded by colonizers and what they did to the 
native uh, americans hmm. okay it was genocide you wiped out us ethnic civilization okay and replaced them with people who came in mostly uh, from the uk yes uh, the practicing hindus in the us 2 3% uh, muslims 4 5% okay uh, so it's you think oh new york so cosmopolitan but in reality the country isn't okay uh, the same can apply to london the city is so cosmopolitan uh, in reality no not so much so when you look at the sheer scale of what india is hmm. the historicity of it uh, the wonder that is as as basham uh, wrote the book on okay uh, then you expand the concept of things that are so natural in so many parts of southeast asia but are so complexly virulent uh, in our own country the birthplace of lord ram ayodhya i mean it's such a massive issue in this country for so many decades yeah. okay why was it an issue okay uh, they literally made another city called ayutthaya in thailand uh, uh, dedicated to lord rama hmm. uh, but in india in the original ayodhya we had a we had a huge problem uh, discussing rama let alone build the temple so if we were to look at the hope of the world hmm. in finding out how can very uh, complex diverse peoples live together in peace and equanimity okay look at india no jewish persecution we didn't start the jihad we didn't start the crusade we didn't start the first world war okay we didn't start the second world war okay we have a civilizational route going going past 5 6000 years maybe more uh, you have a large civilizational footprint which was mm. re- readily embraced by people uh, who were not ethnic from this particular part of the subcontinent okay as we just discussed so if we were to study this the hope of humanity is to be found in the study of this how do we all get along better you never had a, a jewish persecution in india india became host to the last of the persians the zoroastrians uh, and uh, the parsi community uh, here in india uh, we have 200 million um, uh, muslims living in this country we hmm. have a large christian population we are the birthplace of sikhism of buddhism okay which have happened in the last two centuries so they are in the last two millennia so they are well documented hinduism of course origination you can't document as you know as as a pagan religion uh, of of the of the old so there's something wonderful here hmm. uh, and uh, and i'm hoping that through this conversation you've discovered that uh, the the thai the vietnamese the cambodians the indonesian the balinese they all share it and and it's part of their history and culture and who they are it's not imposed and they're not scared of it they don't fear it they don't call it uh, uh, hindu right wingism that's how they live Well, Rishabh, thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time that we have, but we hope that at least uh, it's been an educative exercise for people who are watching this. But at the same time, maybe it's going to push you to plan your next holidays around uh, <clears throat> in Southeast Asia or one of these countries that we've discussed, so that you can actually go there and see what we're talking about. Thank you so much for watching this episode.